darkness, my old friend, and welcome to another episode of Season V of Backseat Designers. I am Frederick Olsen, one of your co-hosts, and I feel like I'm ready in a regular kindergarten tonight because, obviously, I'm joined by my two equally lovely, if not more lovely, co-hosts. First of all, there's Trolls Plymer, Space Quest historian... You can cut uh, this out if you wish. And wife beater extraordinaire. Hello, troll. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello. <laughs> Didn't know my hobbies would be on the list, too. And part time picketeer and fister, Dr. Gareth Millward. Hello. <laughs> Should we do uh, that again? <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm I'm cool. That's uh, everyone. Is, if if anyone's going to send in comments based on that, I, I implore you to become patrons of this podcast, where an explanation shall be found. I, don't I wasn't actually sure if you were going to give the explanation. That's why I made a little. You can edit this out blurb in. Anyway, um, obviously we're joined by someone much more competent than us, and uh, it's a guy who's been on the show before uh, at an equally terrible hour for him down under in the land of Mel Gibson. I can't do an Australian accent, so I'm just going to say hello, Sean Mills. How are you? Hey, fellas, what's happening? He, he does an Australian accent way better than me, but, you know, he yeah, is Australian, that. so, you know. <laughs> It makes I'll tell you a funny story problem. about that. When I go to the States to do like GDC or one of those conventions or stuff, I'm like the most Aussie Aussie. I like practice my Australian accent before I go over there. All those Australian, you know, g'day mate and by golly. Basically, I sound like Steve Irwin when I'm overseas. <laughs> and he's really alive. Yeah, but I mean, the reason that we have you on here is obviously not because wait, you're wait, wait, uh, the wait, wait, crocodile. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Does that mean that you sometimes do an impression of Steve Irwin when he's dead? Like like scrambling undead. Good eye, mate. No, no, I, I can give you my dead Steve Irwin impression if you like. Please do. Yeah, please. Okay, here, here we go. I saw that there. one. <laughs> yes, <miles away. laughs> that was pretty good, though. Round, round of applause. <clears throat> yeah, that was good. That was good. He'll he'll be here all night, or at least for the next hour or so, because but I ain't spending any time have... on it. Because in the meantime, every three months. A person is torn to pieces by a crocodile in North Queensland. <laughs> Bob Catter, how have you got Bob Catter on your soundboard? <laughs> Just for you, Sean. Just for you. <laughs> he didn't tell us about it. The reason you're here is not because you're the crocodile Dundee of adventure gaming, um, <laughs> which you are, obviously. No contest. Uh, it's because you're also a, uh, a you know, apart from... Uh, being one of the CEOs and founders of Infamous Quests, you uh, are also a journalist, and you have been writing a lot about Sierra. And um, way back when, when Trolls and I started this, and Gareth hadn't been invented, um, <laughs> <laughs> the first episode we did was on the new Sierra, you know, the re mm -hmm. revival from a few years um, back. And yeah. we Big were very stuff. hopeful back then, if I remember correctly, but Things seem drunk. to have been... We were also drunk. I mean, we were very, very hopeful, optimistic gentlemen on the air and went off to our depressing lives afterwards. But <laughs> um, take us back for a bit because you've been researching Sierra Online for um, quite a while now. So um, just give us a brief recap of the history of uh, old Kenan Bertie Williams. Kenan Berta. Actually, that's an interesting thing. Everyone calls her Berta when you talk to any of the... Former staff, if, you know. If See, he's already it. upstaging me. <laughs> yeah, so Bertie. Who would, who would call a woman Bertie? Anyway, I mean, do you want? Do you just want like a history of Sierra in a, a three-minute recap or something? Yeah, I was just thinking that was a very comprehensive question. We'll, we'll yeah, be here for like like that. I mean, minutes. to anyone to anyone listening, and you know, I'm thinking that you might know some anecdotes that some people haven't really heard of so i just thought it would be interesting with your spin on it and then broaden it out a bit and look at at the sierra of today which so you yeah. know spoiler time. alert seems to have tanked well that won't that won't take long um <laughs> that's just the same as your deep <laughs> dead steve Irwin impersonation sometime in the oh. hot tub 
cocaine-addled married couple decided to draw stick figures, and lo and behold, a multi-million dollar company was in- invented. There we are. Are they actually okay? So, what got me interested in writing about Sierra, besides the fact that I love the games, I think we all agree on that, is that I, I think it's a really important part of our social history, if I could put it that way. Not to sound too academic, but oh, um, academics. Oh, yeah, I know bunch of tosses um yeah i I just thought it's really interesting that people now you know generations after mine not to make myself sound too old but you know people who are younger than me just don't know about sierra don't know who they are and don't know how much they actually did for the industry basically built the industry um so that that was actually what really got me interested in it you know just those technological marvels you know changes that happened during uh, during the 80s and 90s, were pretty wow. much spearheaded by Sierra for the main. I mean, you can go back to the beginning. I mean, short recap of Sierra, if if there is such a thing. Can for, can for people who've never played an adventure game before, this is the company that you owe everything to. Mm. And if they haven't played an adventure game before, I'm surprised they're listening to this podcast. But yeah, yeah no, really. we won't. <laughs> well, people might listen to it because of the friendly banter and our handsome looks. Nope. No, it's definitely because of the adventure games. Yeah, I, I'd say it's the adventure games. <laughs> okay, so Sierra, late 70s, Ken and Roberta are living in Los Angeles. Ken and Roberta Williams, they're living in Los Angeles. And they're looking for ways to get out of the rat, rat race, basically. And they wanted to go somewhere a bit quieter, a bit, um, you know, raise the kids in the woods. And, you know. <laughs> Makes them sound like a survivalist. <laughs> It does yeah. <laughs> I realized that after I said that, but yeah, I mean, that's basically Ken's, Ken's plan was to, you know, raise the kids away from Los Angeles, you know, I suppose naively thinking that bad things like drugs and whatever don't occur in small towns. Um, so <laughs> they basically came up with, Roberta came up with this idea for this adventure game, Mystery House, uh, the first graphic adventure. While skinning uh, a moose, I I would assume in the wild. Yeah, well, well, no, no, this was still in this was still in LA. So, oh right, you know, they basically sat around the table in you know whatever part of LA they were living in and made this game, hocked it off to a few places, got their bro- got Ken's brother John to drive around and sell it to different uh, you know outlets. Not to be confused with the guy who did the music for Star Wars and Indiana Jones. That's another John Williams. Just you know this guy. This guy, guy. This guy only did. This guy only did the girl in the tower. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! I had a good chat to Mark Siebert about that song. Um, <laughs> yes, he's oddly proud of it, actually. Yeah, strangely enough. Um, oh, I see. He did a song called "Girl in the Tower." This isn't a reference to some kind of sexual crime. <laughs> gone from skinning a moose to physically sexually assaulting women in towers fair enough <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my gosh>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now, as for the serious bit of this show uh <laughs> they put out they put Is out the mystery thing? house and what then happens yeah, so it's uh, it goes it goes gangbusters. It's for the Apple II. That was the big machine at the time. So it uh, it sells. I was about to say it sells hand over fist, but I didn't know if that'd be a good expression on this show. Um, it, <laughs> it sells really well, and it, you know between that and they created a couple more adventure games. Then they moved out to Oakhurst, and then you basically the passage of time they developed King's Quest and Space Quest, Leisure Suit Larry. Uh, you know, different designers came on board, and it was really a. Um, John Williams described it to me as a those early days as a, a college dorm, basically, where they made games as well. And that was sort of the attitude of the whole place. Um, if you read the book Hackers by Stephen Levy, which is pretty old now, but it really describes those sort of eighty, eighty one, eighty two years really accurately. It's a magical place. It's a place where it's, where it's a magical place. Came to they be made, creative. Yeah, that's right. It's it's the magic it's the magic kingdom of computer games. Right. Where it's cocaine basically... flows freely. Well mm-hmm. I have heard some stories along those lines, but I can't name names. I mean, uh, guys, right. it was it was it was the eighties, you know. Let's let's call it exactly. guesswork all we will, but it was the eighties mm-hmm. and it was the world of computing. Uh you know, it's yeah, you're right, it's the eighties. How cool would that have been though? You're you're right at the beginning of an industry that you don't realise is going to be bigger than Hollywood. 
in mm. 30 years' time. And you're basically setting the ground rules, and that's the really interesting thing with Sierra, I think, is that they made the ground rules. People criticise mm. their games now and go, oh, you know, dead ends or this or that or, you know, all the different things that we don't like about them. Right. But, um, you know, they were making the rules. You know, LucasArts were easy. They, they came in in 1989 or 1990 or something and basically said, well, this is what Sierra did. We think they did these things wrong, so we'll just do it this way. So, so you wrote know, out the code sales, basically. Well, yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, that, you know, that, that, I, that's, that's, that's an established fact. I mean, Ron Gilbert said the inspiration for Maniac yeah. Mansion, the, well, I guess not technically the first LucasArts adventure, but really the first one that everyone thinks of. Uh, uh, yeah, it was, was directly inspired by him watching his younger nephew, I think, playing King's Quest 1 and just going, I'm going to be doing that. That's what yeah. Maniac Mansion should be. I'm going to do that and I'm going to do it better. Yeah. You know, and that's that's the way the, anything creative is. You look at something, you get inspiration, you go off and, you know, put your spin on it and try to make it better. And I think in some respects LucasArts did. So, you know, good on them. Mm-hmm. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so that's basically the beginning of Sierra, um, the golden era, just pumped out game after game after game until um, it all went to shit. <laughs> and by the end of the nineties, it was gone. So, you know. right. Well, that's in, that's and, really interesting. How it kind of it, it was this kind of really formative and important company, and yet it just sort of exploded basically by the end of the nineties. Okay, yeah, well, I mean, what would you what would you say, having researched it, would be the reason for that? You know, I've asked a lot of people that question, and every person has a different answer. What's the one you like the best? You know, let's 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 yeah, ditch yeah. the scientific method. What does <laughs> no, Sean no, no. What does Sean Mills <laughs> think is, or what rather, how would you like the demise of Sierra to be? That's how I write all my history. Just pick the explanation you like best and <laughs> run with it. Uh, yes, yes, we do actually yeah, have exactly. a professional historian, and that's how they do it. History is written know? by the winners or the people who ha- who had the least cocaine. Yeah, pick the <laughs> you know pick the reason that'll really sell this episode. Oh, drugs. It was drugs. <laughs> Libel and murder. I, unfortunately, I don't think there's a sexy reason, if that, if I can put it that way. You know? Well, of yeah. course not. It, it's men and, and a, a few w- women in front of uh, CRT screens. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, sex I appeal think, goes out the window. I think uh, something Ken Williams said was that it was – they stopped innovating. They weren't at the forefront anymore, and I think there's some truth in that. Mm. There's obviously the big financial scandal that happened with their parent company. All right. That's a big thing that people, if you just look at it briefly from the outside, you go, yeah, that's probably the reason. I don't think it was the reason, but it's certainly screwed things up a lot. Right. Um, I think lack of direction when uh, Ken and Roberta moved from, when they moved head office basically from Oakhurst up to Seattle. Um. Excuse me, just burping up my Coke there. Um, <laughs> Coca-Cola, Let, let's be clear. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> Always <Coke's> Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, ha- we have in fact been talking about Coca-Cola this entire time. Uh, oh, it's a good thing, it's a a good thing we don't have, you know, it's, it's a good thing we don't have any dentists in our fan base because I think the prospect of you drinking a Coca-Cola at, what was it, five in the morning at your place? It's a bit, yeah, it's five you 30, know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, okay, then it's fair enough, you know, ignore uh, me, move on. I just I just want to say that my breakfast is a can of Coke Zero with a uh, with my blood pressure medication, so. <laughs> but yeah, um the uh, talking to Josh Mandel, which I've uh, mm. had the the great fortune of doing many times. Uh he I had a conversation with him many many years ago back in the late 90s, I think it was, on ICQ yep. of all places and he mm. was he was the one who, bless his heart, uh, ruined the dream of Sierra for me. Uh, in this yeah. conversation, he talked about what happened when the company went big, started acquiring other little companies like Dynamics and Cocktail Vision, yeah. and went uh, went public. And Josh Mandel will say that the the turning point when Sierra started going belly up was the moment they went public. Is there some truth to that? Yeah, I think so. Um, it's a... It's a move from, crea- you know, fo- Ken and Roberta focusing their creative energy on making games and making brilliant product to moving into a more administration 
type role that Ken had to go into when they went public. Mm. Um, you know, and they're dealing with you know shareholders and you know financial backers and all that sort of crap. So I think that's that's a main thing, and that was the reason for their move to Seattle. Uh, that was one of the main reasons, the tax reasons and all that sort of crap as well. But um, one of their main reasons to move to Seattle was because they couldn't get big name administrators or you know financial people or that to move to dinky little locust so they wanted to move all that sort of stuff up there so um I, I think that's the main reason the financial stuff when cuc bought them out that's bloody fascinating that can you know i've actually read the transcripts of the court cases and um sorry i should recap this for people who don't know yeah i was um, just thinking it's it's yeah. a it's a it's a fucking episode of law and order uh and uh, you know and, it and is. It, it's crazy and it involves a person who commits uh, financial fraud, and he's actually named Madoff. Like he, Wait, it was like a license Madoff. for money. <laughs> <laughs> well, he he kind of did. He went into witness protection and became one Dave Gilbert. Yeah. Oh no, that, oh, that's that's libel alert. That is that is actually libel. <laughs> yes. That's right. Oh well. Oh well, that's all right. Dave's Not a good guy. Okay, so there's a there's a dude that um, once they went public, uh, they obviously got a board of directors and that sort of thing. And there's a guy on the board who um, owned. He was the uh, CEO of uh, CUC International, which was a massive conglomerate, one of those '80s companies, you know, that just owned everything. Didn't really. You, you look at it from the outside, it doesn't make sense. You're like, why does this company own? You know budget car rental and, uh, you know, these sell over the phone service thing. And, you know, it doesn't make sense. But anyway, so this guy, um, quite a uh, good businessman, really uh, had a lot of good ideas on the board, according to according to Ken and a few others there. You know, he had good ideas and he contributed. Um, he comes up to Ken after one of the board meetings and goes, hey, look, I'm going to buy you out. And Ken's like, doesn't really want to sell, but, you know, the offer is way above the um, valuation of the company. He's got an obligation to shareholders. Um, it's approved. It's uh, sold off. And there was a lot of deals and negotiations done. Um, Broaderbund was another one that they bought at the same time and all came under the same umbrella. And basically what they wanted to do was make all the – distribution and marketing one department uh but all the studios still run separately and ken was going to step up, sort of above all of it and look after all the development studios so go back to what he used to do you know which was maybe not the hands-on programming but actually you know getting his hands onto games and actually making good product which is what he's really good at um but that all went to that just didn't happen, you know, no. basically tied to he, that didn't happen. Um, he got the hump after a year and left. Um, Roberta hung around for a bit longer and finished up uh, King's Quest VIII, Masters of Eternity. Um, but, you know, that was basically uh, how Ken and Roberta sort of got out. So when yeah. people talk about it, different, you know, different employees talk about it, some say that he left and, you know, cashed the golden check. And there's a bit of truth in that. And some say, you know, he was forced out and there's a bit of truth in that. And it's one of those murky, murky ones. But the story that I've heard is, like you say, it's a bit of both. Like he wanted to stay at the company, but at that point, the company wasn't really his anymore. It had grown so, so large mm -hmm. that he couldn't feasibly have any, you know, hands-on work involved. He had yeah. to attend a bunch of board meetings and buy suits and stuff. And, and honestly, uh, it, after that whole deal, after everything had gone all corporate and businessy, uh, th there was just this sense that his heart wasn't in it anymore. It was like his baby had grown up and, uh, you know, gone rogue or something and joined a hippie yeah. cult or something. He didn't really, uh, or like like the opposite <laughs> of a hippie cult, like a suit and tie cult. Mm, yeah, like a hippie yeah. cult, basically. Yeah, so basically what happened after that is that the parent company merged with another company and became some other big conglomerate. So, you know, it's not big enough. It's mm. the 80s, early 90s. You know, it's not big enough. Let's get even bigger. When they merged, 
the other company was doing due diligence on the books and realised that this parent company had been basically rotting the books um, for tens to hundreds of millions of dollars, just bucket loads of money just being dodgy accounting, mm-hmm. all sorts of stuff, just basically propping up the price of the um, – propping up the value of the company by, you know, dodgy accounting and – uh it all it was a house of cards and it all fell um so that's and the guy that was doing it um uh, walter something he uh he ended up going to jail big court case it was actually the biggest corporate fraud in america to that point right um it was only then dwarfed after that by enron and then bernie madoff so um, in American corporate history, we're talking Sierra's at the focal point of the biggest corporate fraud case of all time. And Dang. so, you know, Sierra itself wasn't involved in it. It was its parent company. But what what does any company do at that point? They go, well, holy crap, what's going on here? We need to, A, now, now we know what the books really look like and we're so far in the red, what can we get rid of? Well, all the companies are then told, get rid of all the products that you don't think you're going to sell, do this, close down studios that aren't making money. And unfortunately for us Sierra fans, the only studio in the Sierra catalogue of companies that wasn't making money was Sierra Oakhurst. Right, which had then been um, renamed to Yosemite Studios, you know. At that point, yeah, the, yeah. at that at that point, the uh, Sierra was basically part of this uh, holy evil triumvirate of Sierra and Blizzard and a third company I can never remember what was it. There's these big three uh, companies: Sierra and Blizzard were were two of them. And, and uh, you know, let's just say it's the Church of Satan because probably. you set it up so nicely. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the uh, the the thing that used to be Sierra, the the golden age where mm-hmm. everything was made, you know, around Ken Williams's hot tub, that was in Oakhurst Sierra, and that had been renamed as Yosemite entertainment yep. and sierra itself like the headquarters were like you said down in seattle and now they were getting into publishing mainly instead of actually making yep. games yosemite yeah. studios as far as i know didn't actually produce any games at least not of note no they did the last couple of uh, like the final quest for glory uh oh. quest for glory 5 came out of them oh the dragonfire um, one yeah yeah dragonfire so you know there's a few things like that but by and large yeah it wasn't what it was even five years earlier. Right. You know, when they when they were throwing out all the big name series, all the tent pole series, um, and that sort of stuff. I mean, I did. I actually um, was talking to Craig Alexander about all this. Now, Craig is um, good old Craig. I am old of- Craig. No, he I was got a mangina. Oh, sorry, not that. No, it's a different when show. I, <laughs> when I, when I was writing the Space Quest FAQ in uh, in in the in the mid nineties, uh, the person I got in mm-hmm. touch with at Sierra Online, the person who made it official, was mm-hmm. Craig Alexander, who was a senior producer wow. at Sierra at the time, I believe. Uh, he was the guy managing director. He ran the studio. Right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So he basically, after Ken left Oakhurst, he. There was a couple of other people, but Craig was there for nearly as long as Ken was. And he's a name that people probably don't recognize a lot. But, um, you know, we were talking about this whole collapse thing. And he said the only reason that Blizzard lasted was Blizzard had, he thinks, maybe Diablo 2, Warcraft 3 just released and making bucket loads of money. Uh, Diablo 2 was huge. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the sad thing about it is it... um, a lot of the people had ownership. A lot of the staff had ownership of Sierra. So when Oakhurst closed, and well, when all the money went down before Oakhurst closed, but when all the money stuff went down, all these, all the staff lost money because they were given a share package when they started. Um, people would ride the shares up and down. You know, mm-hmm. one, I won't say who, but one of the um, one of the uh, game designers told me that. Um, Wall Street never caught on to the game industry at the time. They never understood that basically nothing happens for most of the year and then most of your sales happen November, December. Yeah. Christmas. The, the right. big Christmas so, run. Yeah. So the yeah, exactly. So the the value of the company would drop and drop and drop through the year and then it would spike again in sort of December, January. So, you know. Buy low, sell high. <laughs> was was that was that perhaps a license to print money? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and not hey, well, if Gareth's not going to do it, I am. 
It's Gareth too predictable. Gareth is Gareth is, is an auteur with the oh, soundboard. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> I'm definitely on the auteur spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I mean that's the basic story of Sierra. So that's oh. you know how it all hmm. all went down. A, a lot of the big, a lot of the big names that were, I actually really feel that Sierra was starting to turn a corner. I think product, you know, product wise, they'd gone downhill um, over the late nineties, sort of ninety six to ninety nine. But I really feel they were turning the corner. There was a lot of stuff in production, a lot of people that had joined the company that were that went on to do massive things at other companies. So I really think, you know, early 2000s, if their their production stuff had stayed there, I think they would have really turned a corner. I mean, the big thing out of Sierra at the time was Lord of the Rings Online. You know, that came out by, you know, Warner Brothers or EA or something later on. But that was started development at Sierra in the late 90s and only got picked up when the license went somewhere else. And that was that was actually got in front of the movies. That was before the movies were out, that they negotiated that license with Tolkien Estate and created Lord of the Rings Online. So you're talking one of the big, you know, MMOs. Yeah, and a huge, a huge license as well. I mean, considering how the movies just blew up completely. I mean, that was a phenomenon exactly. back in the exactly. early 2000s. Yeah, so, I mean, there's there's a few things like that. They had the Babylon 5 license, which, you know, they basically finished this game before it got axed. Um, right, based yeah. on Babylon 5, so, um, which was uh, Christy Marks. She was the main designer behind it, but they had filmed scenes with all the cast, um, you know, as cut scenes. And from what I understand, it was a space exploration game, but it was also, um, you know, space combat and... Uh, diplomacy and a storyline like all of Battle on Five. It's you know a big storyline going through it as well. So, and you know it was shown off at the, you know uh, the big gaming expos and all that sort of stuff. So they had some big games and some big ideas that were starting to gel around that time. Um, you know before the button was pushed and it was all shut down. So right, that's that's actually really interesting because up until that point, I mean. By the time that by the time they asked Space Quest Seven, I was a bit like, "Well, I'm done. I'm out." And yeah. and and from that point on, it basically seemed like the only thing that was keeping Sierra afloat was the fact that they were publishing Half Life, which yeah. was which was huge. And then Counter Strike came out and was even more huge. So that was more money in the pocket for uh, for Sierra. That was a publishing deal. Uh, I did know about the Babylon Five project, and I know it was a big like a heartbreaking moment when that thing got the axe. Uh, yeah. I never knew, I never knew what it was actually about. And it, it's, it's actually kind of surprising to me that Sierra, as, as you say, were about to turn a corner and start pumping out original content by yeah. the time shit hit the fan. Well, that was one thing that, uh, you know, Craig Alexander said to me, he said, you know, his idea is that you can link a link something to an established property. And, you know, so people might know that, um, you know, the realm online, if, anyone ever played that back in the day, which was Sierra's sort of half-assed attempt at uh, an MMO. That was massively uh, successful. I, I, know the, I know the name of it. I never played it. Yeah, I never played it because these are American things and, I mean, you guys would have the same problem as me. You know, you can't afford international <laughs> phone calls to dial up their BBS or whatever. Mm-hmm. But... Um, from what I'm told, it was a it was a big deal. The, the realm was like a, a place to hang out, uh, like in a, in a graphical sort of a. I'm, uh, I was about to say LARPer kind of thing. It's like a role playing <laughs> thing where you're just walking around this graphical. It looked like a Sierra Adventure game, and you just walk around and yeah. chat to people. I think Ultima Online kind of copied some things from the realm, actually, didn't they? Yeah, well, from what I understand, the realm's one of the very early attempts at it. They developed systems like and this is going back to talking about you know the things they developed and the things they did they developed things like in-game mail you know which you just mm. take a standard you play world of warcraft now and you send a mail to someone with you know gold or whatever um you know these are things that were developed back then or the you know the protocols to talk to the server so that you don't have to have the full client on you know you can you know the client hardware right type setup thing um you know th- these are all things that they really spent a lot of time in developing um the realm online was actually going to be um quest for glory online all oh, right uh, 
But when uh, Laurie and Corey Cole were brought in to have a look at that, they're like, well, there's no mechanic in this. It's, it's basically ready to ship and you just want to whack the Quest for Glory name on it, <laughs> which yeah. is not a bad idea and we're willing to do that. But there's no uh, mechanic in there for questing. As, as you said, it was a graphical interface. You walk around and talk to people. Mm. And it was really the RPG side of things. It wasn't the, you know, hack and slash which you need in those games. So, you know, that's – but that got them talking to them and they ended up doing Quest for Glory 5. So, you know, that worked out well for them. But right. um, Or they were going to attach the King's Quest name to it because they felt that these major properties were starting to fade away. They weren't selling as much as they used to. Mm. And that's another reason the whole company went balls up in the end as well. They they weren't selling the numbers they needed to sell. And that's, the, you know, the hard truth for big Sierra fans, Space Quest, King's Quest fans like myself. The hard truth is they're, they're not selling as much as they used to. Right, exactly. Space Quest 6 was not did not do very well when it came out. Uh, we all know what happened to Mask of Eternity. It's basically the laughing stock of the Sierra catalog. Ugh. And Dragonfire, while it had good intentions, I, I haven't played it, so this is secondhand knowledge, mm. but while it had good intentions, it was rushed out the door with a lot of bugs, and it just did not fare ver- very well. So all of their... Lots all of, of the final games were rushed out. I mean, King's Quest um, Seven: The Princeless Bride, yeah. has entire line, you know, has has uh, lines of dialogue alluding to complete deleted, you know, not just deleted scenes, but deleted characters. There are uh, lines of King Graham's in there, and he never makes an appearance yeah. in the actual games. You know, it they, it seemed like for those titles, they were rushing for that Christmas sale. Mm. That you mentioned yeah. earlier, you know, fuck me, you gotta get it out by Christmas. We'll we'll cut out the uh, main character of the King's Quest series. <laughs> That's what we'll do, you know. Yeah. Look, um, I I actually spoke to Mark Hudgens, who was the uh, um, art director on King's Quest Seven on Princess Bride, and he actually told me it was like a seven chapter game, and they had to condense it down to like four chapters uh, right. just to get it out. So there is. It's not just cutting lines. It's they cut massive, massive chunks of that game. So, um, actually, interesting story about that, which I didn't know. I didn't realize until I spoke to Mark that they used to actually send their um, commission their artwork at cheap studios overseas. Ah, um, yes, I could have told did. you that. Space Quest One VGA, mainly made by Korean people. Yeah, well, of the yeah. southern variety, not of the. Um, oh, sure. Well, well, the other well, Korea. I don't know. The, the, the spaceship, the Arcader at the beginning of that game does look very North Korean. It does, <laughs> it does suck, but I think that's because it has like a 1950s slant to mm. it. You know, it looks like Soviet <laughs> sci-fi pulp. It's actually a really, you know, I'll go on record saying that I can see why people have a problem with the remake because it alters the tone so much, but it is an interesting choice of, of tone that they went with. Yeah, I think the game's crap. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> it, has a, it has a great score and it has an interesting mm. look, but yeah, pretty much crap. Uh, it's, it's got some interesting bits in it, but you can see the two guys were not in the slightest bit interested. I don't think right. they did any more work than put their names on it. They did. Um, I, can, I can tell you a story there. Uh, they, yeah, yeah. They, were, yeah. they were busy making Space Quest 4 and they are told... At, at at one point, we're going to remake Space Quest One. Uh, you do, you guys don't need to worry about it. We'll we'll just uh, we'll just make it with this uh, Korean studio. Douglas Herring is going to you know design all the uh, graphics and shit. And uh, you know by the end of it, we'll send you uh, we'll send you a copy and you can play test it. And then you can bring us a list of things that you would like changed. Cool, cool. And so that <laughs> happens. Space Quest Four is almost done. Scott Murphy gets sent the uh, you know the beta of Space Quest One VGA. He plays mm-hmm. through it. He he compiles a list of things that he thinks is shit, which is a very long list. Uh, and he hands it in and he is then told the same day that oh we can't change any of this I'm sorry we're too far along in development like yeah, fuck, to this fuck, day yeah. Scott absolutely hates it I absolutely. mean obviously he's he's MIA at the time of making this episode and we yeah. all miss him but don't ever mention that game to him really don't oh. and I get his reasons you know <laughs> because it's kind of like taking his his creative baby yeah. away from him and just doing unspeakable things to yeah, it. You'd have to be a complete and utter monster to remake a, a Space Quest game. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I, I just say that mine was successful. 
So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a bit more true to the original, wasn't it? Um, I mean, it, it it had it it had a bit more in keeping with the tone of the original, I'd say. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I based it on the well, we based the graphic style on Space Quest Four. Right. Yeah. And I, which I think is the definitive look for Roger. So, uh, even Couldn't things in the VGA remake of One, like the color of his hair, just pisses me off. I, I don't <laughs> That's know. That's true. He's very, you know, he, it's basically bleached blonde. Yeah. You know? It's like, it's, yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, question, question about uh, the early days of Sierra when things started to go badly and we will get to the new Sierra in just a bit because I think we're about over the halfway mark I think something like that yeah yeah, yeah. why not so, so a, a thing that because uh, I read your articles on adventuregamer.com about uh, your, your five part um, retrospective of Sierra and it was very very interesting reading uh, the, uh, the part that interested me the most was when you were talking about they brought in this dude at I don't know just just before the mid nineties like early nineties mid nineties when they started shifting to VGA they brought in this dude who taught them how to storyboard and all yeah. of a sudden the production um, uh, the, the the production schedules and such got very long and you had to you know map shit out in advance for a long time. Um, yeah. So there was no more seat of the pants design, which uh, let's be clear, all of Space Quest One and Two were designed just basically spur of the moment kind of things. Yep. That just went out the window, uh, and you pointed to that at least not, not uh, at least implicitly. You pointed to that as sort of a turning point from when people started getting a bit disgruntled with the way that the games were being produced at Sierra. Is that inaccurate? Uh, no, that's accurate. It's it's a it's a flip of a coin. So Bill Davis is the guy you're talking about there. Now Bill right, right. is a talented talented man he is um he'd worked he's got emmy awards he's you know got this massive resume of work he worked on um uh, laughing and shows like that doing art design and stuff for that those sorts of tv shows and right, um right. so he gets recruited by sierra uh, by by ken basically ken saw 256 colors coming down the pipeline and said we can't keep making the games we can't keep making games the way we're making them because we're just going to run out of time and it's just not going to work. You know, you can't spend five years making a game, which, you you know, art's going to increase the time. Uh, right. And so um, he brought in Bill to, to set as middle management, and this is where the conflict happens. Um, uh, before Bill's arrived, designers would basically answer to Ken. Mm -hmm. um there's there's two sides of the game production there's the designer who's you know the the you know the name on the box the allos the <laughs> yeah you know the coals people like that um they do all the they do all the fun stuff and then you've got the producer of the game who does all the paperwork and um you know that used to be one it, guy right guruka Sinkalsa. exactly guruka and he is a great guy i had a He's actually the second person I interviewed for those articles, mm. and um, he's a he's a fantastic guy. Um, amazing hair, amazing hair, amazing beard, yes. amazing um, name. Yes, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So he uh, basically Garuka's job is to sort of liaise with the designer and say, "Where's your design?" Make sure it works. Okay, so Garuka told me this story about how he used to sit with, um, you know, when Christy Marks got there. Christy Marks was a brilliantly talented writer but had never designed games before. So there's a logic flow when you design a game. You know, you've not just got to work out start, middle, and end. You've got to work out the options and the alternative mm. uh, ways of doing things and that. So, And he would tell the me. The actual this, game bits of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So he, he would sit down with Christy when they when she first got there and they first started designing Camelot, and he says, you know, we would just sit down on a, a, under a tree outside and just storyboard ideas and just basically get, um, you know, just work through how things would work. He says, you know, and that's the golden era. That's the time he says was just absolutely amazingly brilliant. Um, yeah, this is uh, 90, 90, 1990 or 91 or something like that, right? Yeah, probably a bit earlier because it was released 89. in the early 90s, so probably right. a year before that. But right. um, 
Yeah, so, you know, that's sort of Garuka's job, but also to, you know, he's given the budget, so they they have to make the game for 500000 He has to work out how they're going to do that, you know. So that's sort of Garuka's job there. Now, that job got massive, and that's where Josh Mandel enters the picture. He's employed first as a beta tester and then as um, Garuka's offsider mm. in, the, in the production side of things. So that's how Josh enters the picture. But... Um, so you've got that sort of level of uh, management. It's really nothing. Those two people I answer to can. Yeah. Uh, when Bill comes in, Bill sits in between that. Bill sits above them, below Ken, and he's the one who has to make the hard decisions. He's the one who goes, you know, Codename Iceman was a balls up from start to finish with the design because it was designed the way they'd always designed. They basically, you know, drew a map, and then, you know, people started programming the game and started drawing the art and stuff before the design was finished. Right. And it's just like, you know, this is this is crazy. Even to me talking about it, I'm thinking this is nuts. <laughs> but And so Bill's idea is like, no, storyboard it like you would a cartoon. Mm-hmm. Do this, do this, do this. And he, would, he storyboarded like the major, you know, GUIs, the major interfaces and stuff like that. So... It went from that really open, creative, fun feel to a very structured, this is the process that you need to do before we're assigning a producer. Um, and then the producer's going to say, well, you know, this is how much money you've got. I don't think you're going to be able to do this and we'll have to cut these bits. So, um, But do you think, do you well, think can, that can, that's can, one can, of the reasons for the sort of the, the reasons why people don't look as fondly on some of that later Sierra stuff is that the early stuff is more free form and sort of handmade, so to speak. But as the demands yeah. of the industry increase, it has to be more of an industry. I, yeah, I, I definitely think so. I think, look, those early AGI games, you know, those those parser input games, um, they, yeah, they have that feel of just, you know, this can go anywhere and do anything. I think um, Quest for Glory 1, Heroes Quest, is the best example of that. Um, there is so much, you know whimsy and optional things that you can do and that that I think if you plotted it out you wouldn't have because I know from talking to Corey Cole that a lot of those really cool little things in the game were just designed on the spur of the moment Mm -hmm. um so you go from that I I do think that when Bill came in that was the height of Sierra that period that three or four years after Bill started that was the height of Sierra. That's your early VGA game. So that, that's King's Quest Five and King's Quest Six and um, you know Space, Space Quest Four and right. um, you know all of those sorts of games came out at that time, which I reckon are the best because they're the best stories with a beautiful art and you know that they weren't rushed to the point of being you know buggy as all mm. <laughs> get out as they were later on. So I think that's the real golden era. So yeah, I think Bill is actually probably one of the people in the company that is one of the biggest um, biggest linchpins of why they were successful, I think, Bill Davis. So. Right. But so, a bit of a controversial figure because, as you say, he did not encourage different departments to actually converse, like the coding department and the art department should stay in their own corners. As Correct. As yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, well, that's exactly right. I mean, these people were that was part of his production process as well. Um, and it, it changed over time, you know, things changed and ebbed and flowed, but there were, there were time periods, especially after he first got there that, um, you know, it was very then segmented. Whereas previously the five people working on a game would sit in a room. Um, now Bill can cop the blame for saying, well, the musicians are over here and the artists are here and the animators are here and the, you know, programmers are here. But product, look at the credits of those games. You look at Space Quest One. Four people worked on that game, and yeah. I think one of them, one of those credits, is basically you know um, because they liked the guy. You know, I don't know if they did much work on it. So <laughs> I mean, then they did so they did some double functions. I mean, the theme is written by Mark Crow, isn't it? If I'm not exactly. mistaken. Yeah, that blew yeah, me away when Mark told me that. I was just like, that is so cool. Yeah. That's a talented dude. Yeah, not really <laughs> renowned for his mu- musical skills, but there it is. 
Oh, well, Marco uh, wrote the uh, theme tune and Al Lowe programmed it into the game. So, yeah, there you yeah. go. And, and you know, the, the first Space Quest 1 uh, crunch time for that game was a big old pizza party at Ken Williams's house. They would just go in, they'd code, and they'd fall asleep on the floor. They'd get up, get in the hot tub for a half an hour, mm -hmm. soak until, you know, the hangover wore over and uh, wore off and then go in and code some more. Mm. The, 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 other great, the other great crunch story that Ken and Roberta's was... Um, Black Cauldron, which um, you guys have uh, probably spoken to Scott, and he might have relayed this one before. But yes, um, where Mark know, and it's... Scott met. Mm. Yeah, exactly. The romantic Mark story met. in the hot tub. The... <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. It is. It is massive. You know, in this massive office that Ken had with this, um, you know, counter around the edge of it. And Al Lowe's told me the story, so I've heard his perspective of it as well, because he didn't live in. And people don't realise this. Al didn't actually work in the Oakhurst studio. He generally worked from home and just came in, um, you know, for a couple of days a week or a, or a day a month or something, just to liaise with people and that. And then he'd go back and go back to programming and whatever. Um, he actually lived at Ken and Roberta's house for the end of the Black Cauldron and would work for twelve or fourteen hours and then go upstairs and have a sleep. And it was during that sleep time that Mark and Scott. Um, worked away on Space Quest and then jumped back mm. to the Black Cauldron at the same time. So it's, yeah. that was that was another period where the whole company nearly went balls up. But that's um, yeah. Okay, so speaking we, yeah. of uh, speaking covered. of balls up, I mean we've now covered mm. the uh, the classic. I mean we've. This is kind of like stuff that I, I'm guessing that most people is, most people listening to this will know Sierra, but they might not know some of these anecdotes. Mm. Um, but obviously, there was a revival a couple of years ago in that Activision reactivated a Sierra brand, and they put out a couple of games published by that, chief among them a new King's Quest, which yeah. seemed to be received okay. It was episodical, and there were like five episodes in total. They're done now, but we haven't heard anything from this quote-unquote Sierra for a while. Why do you think that is? Um... <laughs> now I'll just preface this by saying that this is all just my opinion. I have no inside knowledge whatsoever about um, this. Is how, how every episode era. with you goes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, but seriously, we, we all all the people we've just mentioned, all the nice anecdotes, and all the lovely people mm. in hot tubs we've mentioned, all gone. None of that is in the new Sierra. New Sierra there isn't is, even a hot tub. There, no, is there no, isn't even a bathtub. No, as far as I know, there's a urinal, and that's it. And it's it's a you know. Co-ed urinal, so yeah. <laughs> and people it's have not, sort of it's not being cleaned up, so it's all sticky yeah. and smells like public <laughs> toilet. <laughs> as far as we know, hi, exhibition. Hope yeah. you're having fun. Oh, uh, look, I, I don't know. I I have a feeling. Okay, so you know, see the good adventure games. You know, your, your King's Quest sixes and your um, uh, Space Quest fours and all that. They sold around. You know, between two and three hundred thousand copies back in the day. Mm. You know, and that was a that was a major hit. That was a massive, massive hit. Um, part of the reason those series were axed was because in the late nineties, King's Quest Eight: Mask of Eternity, which is, uh, you know, as we said, you know, it's pretty derided by, um, you know, fans and that. It's actually the biggest selling King's Quest game. <laughs> <laughs> It's that's the that's the interesting part, you know. Space Quest Six is the biggest selling Space Quest game. The King's Quest Mask of Eternity it looks like someone just took a poop on your monitor and made it move around on its own. <laughs> I oh, mean, yeah. literally poop because that. Uh -huh. I like a nice shade of brown, but that <laughs> game is <laughs> that right game is, is, yeah, is, is very not the time brown, to bring up I mean. your. No, never mind. Yeah, I mean, if I look at you know, if I. If I eat Mexican and I sit on the jar and I have a good squeeze <laughs> and I get up and I look down, then there is going to be less brown down there than there is in Mask of Eternity. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, you're... Uh, yes. <laughs> I, you know, but they still only sold those sorts of numbers. That's the thing. And I think that's one of the reasons... You get um, missed is the big game. It sold well over a million copies. So the expectation is then, well, adventure games can sell over a million copies. So if it's not selling a million copies, it's a it's a flop. 
And it's not a change in the games. It's not a change in the market even. It's a change in the point of view of the sales departments of these companies. That they can't, They're just not selling the numbers they want to sell. They're selling the same they've always sold, but they're not selling the numbers they need to, they, they want to sell. So right. um, I think where I was going with that, um, <laughs> I, think the, I think the problem with the new King's Quest is I don't think it would have sold much more than that. Right. That, and that's, that's the question, isn't it? That's the question. If, if, if Mask of Eternity did write but is universally derided, is it, did they just restart Sierra because they thought, well, enough time has passed, we can give this another go? People are going to want another Mask of Eternity. <laughs> <laughs> People are probably not going to want another I Mask of Eternity. I don't think so that you know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look. I, yeah, maybe. maybe. Maybe they thought enough time had passed. That you know, there's a very vocal community out there for Sierra games. Yes. I don't know how big it is, but it's very vocal. <laughs> um, exactly. Yes. And you know, I, I think it can appear to be bigger than it is. Look at something like you know, the the, the big Sierra gamers group on Facebook has what three or four thousand people in it. Mm. Even if every person in that bought the game, um, and let's assume they did. You know, putting aside my comments from last episode, <laughs> um, you know, assuming they all bought a copy of the game, that's still only three or four thousand copies. Let's, you know, let's be generous and say it's ten thousand copies. Right. You know, where, where are the other, you know, nine million nine hundred thousand? Uh, sorry, you know, nine hundred and something thousand copies coming from to be a million seller? All right. I and, don't know. And, and how, how much? How much are you going to bank on? On you know the nostalgia because already when when you're when you're restarting a brand and the first game you're putting out is the return of King's Quest, I th I would think and and this might just be my own bias but you would think oh Granddad's getting a new computer game finally it's like it's, it doesn't really have that modern market appeal does it? No, I don't think so. I th I think um, yeah, the, Ron there's Gilbert nothing wrong. Being surprised about Thimbleweed Park not selling amongst younger audiences. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, like I said, maybe that is my own bias. Um, maybe not. Maybe think, the world was. I think. I think. Uh, well, I don't think it was because it's obviously, regardless of whether we know the figures or not, they haven't made a new one. They haven't announced a new game. They haven't gone. Hey, this worked with King's Quest. We've got Space Quest. We've got Police Quest here. These are all big games. I think what Space Quest is unlikely them? because they're afraid that Scott Murphy will turn up with a knife and some or something and go <laughs> gong ho on everyone. <laughs> No, it's, it's, it's a good point. It's a good point because because they're going to come out the gate and say, right, we're reviving the biggest franchise we had. Now, as much as I love Space Quest, you, you'd have to readily admit that King's Quest was just, first of all, the trailblazer. It was the flagship product. Every new tech absolutely. went into King's Quest. It's the, it, go it's the golden boy. It was the golden boy. Absolutely. So we're going to revive that. It has that. nothing to do with the fact that the, that the lady who designed the games was sleeping with the boss. Oh no, no! But and actually, I think you know, half joking or not, but that is actually it. It, it did have universal appeal. It was uh, not not just because Roberta Williams was designing it. It did have more of a mass appeal. Although, yeah. uh, this kind of a tangent. But you know, in the mid '90s, internet comes along, and there's a lot of Space Quest fan sites, not a lot of King's Quest sites. But anyway, point is. You revive well, tech geeks, isn't it? Really, rather than, uh, it than yeah, anything else. I it kind think of so. When yeah. Space Quest was for That's geeks true. and King's Quest was more for a probably the audience about a computer mainly to use Word Perfect, and then they were intrigued by moving this little uh, yellow kingy guy around on yeah. the screen. I, mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think there's a, there's a larger demographic for King's Quest and not necessarily all of them wanted to go online and make fan pages in Web 1.0. Mm. Um, so, and, anyway. And Police Quest didn't really sell that well because the <laughs> uh, supposed audience was out with, uh, you know, open carry and shit. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, don't, we don't even have to go into King's Quest. Or, um, no, but the thing is, okay, you rebrand uh, Sierra Games and you yeah. revitalize the uh, flagship product and you expect that to set the benchmark for sales. So when it is... Um, uh, let's say kind of forgotten. And I mean, the first episode got a lot of marketing push and then it's yes. it really dwindled to the point where you weren't even told that there's a new episode out. You just have to go on steam and go, Oh wait, the new episode is out. Hey. Um, 
they kind of sort of buried it and, and went, well, fuck it. It's not selling how we like. They are not going to go back and go, well, it's uh, Space Quest time. It's uh, Quest for Glory time. Let's rebrand all these. They are just going to go, eh, yeah. well, uh, it was an experiment. Didn't really pan out like we expected it to. Here's some indie games so we can say that we didn't just release one game. So here's a couple of, I don't know, what the fuck was it? Geometry Wars or some shit like yeah. that. Oh. And then <laughs> bugger it. So, so I guess what, yeah, my, I, my I question, oh, sorry. You, if you want to interject, please do. Yeah, we're oh. coming up on the end time, so let this be the final interjection and our answer. Oh, um, oh, better make it interesting then. Oh, sure. Um, I just don't know if I can do that this hour in the morning. Well, I kind of do have one question <laughs> after this one, and then okay. I promise we'll wrap uh, it that's up. That's all right. So. Ask your question. I'd actually forgotten where I was going, so. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm guessing. No, no, you're good. Uh, knowing what you know about the uh, history of Sierra and especially mm. where it kind of fell apart with the business takeover and the stockholders and all of that shit, uh, Activision's re- uh, rebranding of Sierra games, do you think that was just kind of an experiment to see if these new IPs would float? Because Activision's been sitting on all of these IPs for all this time and they have been, yeah. you know... There's, there's been these stories about shutting down fan projects, Space Quest 7 getting the axe, the silver lining, having mm-hmm. to sell their souls to get the game Space out. Space Quest 7 shit. getting the axe, that's a very nice way of putting it. Oh, it got it got fisted in the ass, didn't it? Um, so do you think this was like activist... <laughs> Stop bringing your orders? sexuality into it. <laughs> <laughs> I think you like it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, and and oh, the politeness. No. Um, <laughs> do you think it was a testing of the waters? And do you think that they're just going to pack it in and go, right, let's wait another 20 years? Or do you think we can expect more from the new Sierra games? What do you think? Based on evidence, we're not going to see any more because they haven't posted on Twitter since like 2016 or something. So mm-hmm. um, I, think it was, I think it was a toe in the water to see if these franchises still have money in them. Yeah. And that's let's be honest, you know, break it down. That's what that's what companies are interested in, money. So um, I think it was a toe in the water. I, you know, just to put my own developer hat on, I, I don't know if I would have gone the way they went, you know, with a big budget, multi-part. I certainly wouldn't have gone a chapter game because adventure game fans hate chapters. And, <laughs> you know. Um, are you listening, sort of, Telltale? Well, Sorry. I mean, Sorry. look where Telltale are now. So um, didn't they just fire like a third of their staff or something? Yeah, they did. Yeah. Long, yeah, dirty, so, dirty story. But anyway. Yeah. yeah so, the, so, but anyway, not that I don't like Telltale's games. They did some good stuff. But, um, yeah, I, yeah, I just think that I would have done something like, you know, is Tim Schafer doing all right out of those LucasArts remakes? Obviously well enough that he's able to do the next one. Because he's done three or four, all right. So maybe that would have been a better way to go. Do a you know do reimaginings and capture that um, initial market. You know you could probably do a remake of. Oh, honestly, you'd probably want to do the first three King's Quests in one game because of the size of them, or the first that, three Space Quests or something. But wasn't that kind of what they did? I mean, the new King's Quest was kind of a recap kind of, of a what reboot, had happened. You know, kind of a re. Uh, Telling with some yeah. embellishments. I, I don't really know what they were trying to accomplish because it's not a reboot. It's not even a soft reboot. It's like uh, it's like in between the existing episodes. Oh, it's like, oh, and this is what happened between two and three. Or well, this is what happened after, you know, uh, after Alexander was stolen and before he escaped and got back 20 years later. So mm. this is what happened in there. And, you know, they, they did they're reimagine. Already it. there, you're appealing to a crowd that knows the existing stories. You know, you're not well, that's, appealing. That's, and, that's exactly and you're right. Appealing, that's... And you're appealing to a crowd that has the patience to sit through something that has a resolution as uh, inferior to any post-Nokia 30. 3310 cell phone. But that's why it's so much cheaper to just put the original software up on GOG or Steam and just let a passive yeah. amount of little money trickle in. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't yeah, cost I mean, them anything, does it? 
you know? Sure. I mean, that that's what happened with uh, Simon the Sorcerer. It, it just came out. Apparently, there was a big budget remake in the works. I've seen screenshots on Twitter of really, really gorgeous character and background art. Mm-hmm. And in the end, they just stuck it up there with uh, the filters turned way up. It's basically running in Scum VM. It just, fuck it, let's sell it for five quid or whatever. Um so, so what, 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 what you're saying with with the dev hat on, with us being the backseat designers and everything, mm. um, the way you would have rebranded Sierra was to ke- first get a real good f- hard grip on the fan base, as it were, and maybe yeah, modernize so. modernize some classics, and then start looking towards the future. Now, here's my question with that: um, Leash yeah. Suit Larry, the replay game, uh-huh. that didn't yeah. that didn't fare terribly well, and that was a remake of well. A game that had already been remade of the butt twice, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think Leisure Suit Larry is different. I think Leisure Suit Larry just doesn't sell in a modern market. That's I, true. I think, the pre- yeah. I think the premise of the game, I think um, everything about that game, um, I, I like them. I think they're funny games. I think, you know, the humor in them, especially the later games, but, you know, even those early ones, you know, the humor in them, that, that, that appeals to me, that sort of crude... Um, you know, sophomore humour, I suppose you'd call it, you know, Animal House, that sort of stuff. But I, I don't think it would sell in the modern market. I, I don't think you could make that. I don't think you could pitch that game now and it would sell and it no. would be even picked up. No, that would be a so, time it was written. Exactly, exactly. And it's it's a great example of, you know, people's attitudes of the 70s and 80s. Um, I, I had a great chat with Josh about, uh, Josh Mandel about, Larry and I said, you know, if you reboot Larry, what do you have to do? And the idea that we came up with, and because this will never happen, I'll share this, um, is that you know what happens if a modern protagonist goes back in time into that Larry, you know, think Larry one goes back in time to that Larry one, mm. and so you, you then have the counterplay of a modern take on. Larry acting 70s, 80s pervert. So, you know, you can go, you know, Larry's a loser and he's basically, um, oh, you know, all the, all the, you know, yeah, the fish out of water kind of sexist. thing. Mm. Yeah, the fish out of water thing. And, but you can, you can filter that through the modern protagonist. Right. And go, you know, still have all that stuff there, and so people can enjoy it on that level, but have a new level above that, looking at it through this new lens of, you know, modern PC culture, and, right. you know, make fun of it that way as well. And that's sort of the only way we could think of that you could actually modernize Larry in a way that would sell. Right. Me, at least, at least Larry accept- meets Bill and Ted, really. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, needs a bit of that bit of perspective. Yeah, just yeah. Uh, that, that's actually interesting. Just going back, so so you can roll your eyes at it with modern eyes, and then yeah. you know, still so indulge. Basically, in- you can. So basically, you can feel comfortable. So so a modern person can feel comfortable laughing at these jokes that they shouldn't be la- You know that they shouldn't, mm-hmm. in inverted commas, be laughing at. Um, but still have those jokes because they are funny. That's so. a great idea, and you know, a very yeah. good. Actually, an idea that would have been kind of interesting for the new Sierra to explore. Mm. And mm. I guess it's a bit of a shame that, as you say, we probably won't see more Larry games. Or see more Sierra games in general. It, it yeah. seems like yeah, they're, yeah. Just, they're, they're, just, they're just quietly trying to bury it, hoping that people won't remember. So, you know, speaking of full circle, this was the first episode we ever did. We talked about, hey, Sierra's back. This is going to be interesting to watch. And now I think we can comfortably say that... Well, it it really wasn't that interesting to watch. We're very sorry. So this is going to be you, the last ever episode. We have uh, outlived our purpose. Uh, actually, no. <laughs> Schadenfreude. <laughs> what, what, what were actually, you saying, John? I, sorry, I just wondered if you guys had actually played the um, the, the King's Quest or, or the Larry remake, actually. Played a bit of the Larry remake. Uh, did yeah. not play the King's Quest one. I played episode one of King's Quest and liked it. I played episode two and kind of lost interest. You know, I really don't do episodic, you know, and episode one is actually a very nice rounded off kind of story. You know, it's short, but I I enjoyed it. Uh, I I enjoyed the graphical style of it. I enjoyed the voice talent. I enjoyed the story. Oh, what what really money went. 
Yeah, but what what really fucked me off about the King's Quest remake was not so much the content of it. I mean, haha, I am the Space Quest historian. I hate King's Quest, blah blah. It's yeah. the it's the absolute uh, dig watery they pulled at the end where they said, right, it's an episodic game. There's five episodes, and you can buy them all individually. But if you want the epilogue episode, you have to buy the whole thing again. Right. Fuck you. Right. Yeah. That was right. terrible. Yeah, that Very was, true. That was bad marketing. Um, I I think. What would you feel if I said, I mean, what's your opinion if I said, um, you know, that first King's Quest I think is a pretty good game, the, the first chapter, um, for what it is. I agree. Take the King's Quest label off it. Do you think it sells better? I th- no. <laughs> uh, I, I, w- I, I wouldn't say that actually, because, and I think this is probably going to be the final you know, piece of debate because we have mm. to wrap up the episode after this. But, but no, I... Th- I think it relies a lot on the name. I'm not sure there is a market for that kind of story. You know, people were complaining about this game mechanically all along. They were complaining about the fact that the protagonist is kind of a Guybrush Threepwood type. You know, yeah. partly because it's King Graham there, but it, it kind of... Ironically. <laughs> yeah, it kind of seemed to read, we've seen this before, you know. I'm not, and I'm not sure the market would be there to begin with if it didn't have that label on it. You know, I'm not... Mm. I'm talking out of my ass here, but that's basically yeah. what this show is all about. But that's my opinion on, uh, on it. <laughs> the show, that's my life, talking out of my ass. <laughs> <laughs> It basically is the tagline for this show as well. Yeah, and we, <laughs> you know, we've had a splendid time of of you doing that here. Do you have anything you want to add before we uh, move into the ending spiel? Oh, look, actually, something I did want to talk about very briefly is that we, you know, in the last episode, I did bring up this whole Lucas Arts and Sierra war, and you know, fans mm. of one, fans of the other. I was actually just thinking about that after the episode. I know that, you know, uh, someone like Dave Gilbert, who's a good friend of mine, um, you know, said, you know, who cares? It was 20 years ago. And he's perfectly right. Who does care? The point that I actually was trying to make in my rambling, ridiculous Australian way was that it was (laughs) the the war itself between the two companies doesn't matter because neither exists anymore. But it is it is a war of style. Right. And I think that's what's won now. I think the LucasArts style is what is out there now. Yes. It's a progression of that style. Even Telltale is a progression of the LucasArts style. Yes. Um, you know, that real character-driven, real story-driven, you know, very few, if any, um, dead ends or deaths or anything like that. And I, I think that's really what I was trying to get at, was that's the difference between the two things. And I think... Honestly, the Sierra style in that in this, that respect is what is um, it doesn't sell now. I think that's the that's the truth of it. And I think that particular King's Quest also had that Sierra style to it, and that could be one of the reasons. You know, it's mm. all just ideas, throw them up like confetti and see which ones stick. But you know. Um, that was just sort of my general thought of it. One of my yeah. kids is crying in the background. Can you guys hear that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> kind of a, kind I mean, of a flashback to the Stephen yeah, Alexander episode. Your kid is a lot less cheery than Stephen Alexander's <laughs> kid. <laughs> <laughs> she, was, she was playing the xylophone and babbling into the microphone, and yours is just going, where's daddy? Yeah. You, and you, you say that, and Steve says that's what's happening, but honestly, he doesn't have kids, and that was all just him mucking around in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Swerve, well, bro. That bombshell. It's time to ask you, Sean, uh, if thieving yeah. cunts want to uh, hit you up on the big internet, where do they do <laughs> so? Where can one find your presence? And do they still owe uh, you yeah. money? Well, I think some people do. Um, <laughs> but, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, so, Twitter's the best place to get me, Sean Mills77. Is my Twitter handle? Actually, I do. I'll give a plug for my other my other Twitter thing. If this yeah. all yeah, thing, sure. um, I run something called Expect Games, which is a really cool little um, Twitter feed where I talk about games that I like, mostly older games, but you know, a um, couple you, hundred followers now. Yeah, that's me. Didn't you know that? I don't think I did. 
Oh, that's oh, interesting. I've, I've, I've had interactions with expat games and just went, oh, this seems like a nice bloke. Uh, it's fucking yeah. Sean, is it? No doubt it was. <laughs> there you go. Well, there you go, see. <laughs> <laughs> Told, uh, anyway. We DM all the time. You could have told me that. Okay, so actually, on that bombshell, um, <laughs> if you want to interact with uh, any of us who make up this humble little show, you can do so at our website, uh, backseatdesigners.com, where you can find links uh, to subscribe to the show. You can leave a comment if you want to. You can also hit us up on Twitter at BS Designers or at our open Facebook group, uh, simply called Backseat Designers. Uh, and if you're not a porn bot, there's a good chance we'll want to let you in. If you are a porn bot, we probably will as well because we can't be asked to vet you. Uh, what we also have for you lovely people is a Patreon at patreon.com slash backseat designers where you can uh, finance our trips, uh, our yearly trips to Adventure X in London, basically, and get to hear some of the awful off the cuff stuff that we do before uh, airtime. So, exclusive do giving in. Exclusive yeah. content for you, thieving cunts. Or for actually, we're the thieving cunts in this analogy, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Yeah, I think we are. We are actually the thieving cunts. <laughs> yeah, so that's a third bombshell, and frankly, that's enough bombshells for one evening. So, <laughs> suck a cuck, Gareth. Suck a cuck. Beat your wife, trolls. <laughs> I think you like it. And it's a what from me as well. <laughs> and we'll see you out there. Finished.